Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. It's April 2021. We've just had the Generation 4 Lightning teapot added to the Harrier. So we're going to do a brand new tutorial from scratch. The first thing to point out is that it is very different to all of the other teapods in the game. For instance, Hornet, uh, JF-17, A-10C. So my advice is to basically forget them and let's just start from scratch. So, from the main menu here, options, this is very important. We're going to go to special, we're going to go to AV8B. This option here, enable action, no action, TDC. The best way to describe that is if it's unticked like that, you've got quote unquote easy mode, where as soon as you slew the teapot, you know, you move it around to a different angle, then it will automatically create a T0 target and ground stabilize. That's your default configuration as far as I'm aware. If you want the realistic mode where that does not happen and once you've slewed you have to press TDC down button to actually designate a target. To reiterate, easy mode, that's how I have it. That's how we're going to do it in this video and that's why I would suggest having it. If you want realistic mode, go like that, but that is not what we're going to be looking at today. Okay, so let's put it back there. Okay, on the ground now we can have the lightning pod on stations 4b 5 and 3 we'll go for 4b today Request rearming. to activate we're going to go on our right mfd here menu here t-pod there standby there to turn it operational now that started immediately and that's because i'm using a hot spawned aircraft here if i were using a cold spawned aircraft we would have to wait a certain amount of time for it to warm up. But otherwise, that teapot is essentially good to go. Let's look at today's controls. Let's start with the sensor select switch SSS. Double press of sensor select switch down, assuming that we are not in teapot HOTAS mode and that the teapot is not soy, will put the teapot into HOTAS mode and make the teapot soy. If we're already in teapot hotest mode and we've already got it soy, it will do the opposite. And soy, soy sensor of interest by the way, will return to the previously selected sensor. We'll go through this in a bit. Next, sensor select switch aft short. When I say short, I mean a quick press of that button, less than 0.8 seconds. Firstly, cycles the different track modes of which we have area, point and moving target also releases the laser spot track mode and returns to previously selected track mode. Thirdly, cancels a laser spot search that's in progress and returns to the previous selected track mode. After long, so press and hold for more than 0.8 seconds, selects INR track. I just say for all of these, we're assuming that the teapot is soy and is in teapot HOTAS mode left short cycles field of view narrow or wide left long activates laser spot search right short assuming that we are in FLIR or ir mode will toggle the polarities white hot or black hot and if we're not in ir mode it won't do anything right long toggles between ccd and FLIR mode forward short activates l tip that's the laser ranger Forward long, if the AGM-65 Echo, the laser maverick, are the selected weapon, it removes the teapot page and replaces it with the laser maverick page. Next, nosewall steering, really important for use of the Generation 4 teapot. Almost impossible for me to explain here exactly what it does, but as a basic roundup, it's going to allow us to cycle between different modes. For instance, a snowplow or a vertical velocity slave or a designation. We'll come back to that. TDC down will create a target designate. Finally, TDC forward, aft, left and right will literally slew the teapot up, down, left and right. To make this relatively complicated video as easy for you to follow as possible, we're going to split it into five sections. One, sensor slaves and soy, SOI, sensor of interest. Two, initial pointing. Three, overall symbology, four target tracks, five laser. We could have had a sixth I suppose laser spot search and laser spot track but we're going to cover them in a separate video. First of all 
soy and center slaves. So the first thing to point out is that in our standard configuration, our teapot is not soy, it's not center of interest. Another way of saying that is we do not have teapot potas mode on. We know that because it says INS here. So if it says INS, we cannot use the teapot. Instead, the teapot is slaved to another sensor. We can see it's slave here. We can see which sensor it's slave to because it says here, HUD DES. It's currently slave to the HUD. Well, let's change that. Why don't we make the uh, the current sensor of interest the map? I could click DES here. Sorry that I'm zoomed out a bit, but you get the idea. Well, I've now made the map soy, and look, the teapot is now slave to the map, map designation, okay? Let's get rid of that. Why don't we go to uh, the DMT, so the TV sensor. I'm just gonna go and find it. It is there. The DMT is now soy, and if I move it about, you can see up on the hard it moving, you can see the DMT screen here moving. And now look, in the teapot screen, TV DES. That means that the teapot is now slaved to wherever the DMT looks. So that shows how we can sl so that shows how we can slave the teapot to other sensors. Now I want full control of the teapot and I want to actually use the teapot independently. I want to make it soy or put it in HOTAS teapot mode. To do that, double press sensor control switch down. We know that it's in HOTAS teapot mode and soy because it now says teapot. Before we start using the teapot for any further, let's just show you that we can reverse that decision. If we want to get out of the teapot, have it no longer soy, no longer have it HOTAS mode, again, double press SSS down, and it now reverts back to the previous sensor. In this case, I think it was the DMT uh, that we got soy. So now we're gonna press it again and go back into the teapot. So SSS down twice, and we're back in to the teapot, the teapot is soy. So I just wanted to spend a bit of time there showing A, how to slave the teapot to other sensors, B, how we can make the teapot soy and use it. The next section we're gonna look at is initial pointing. If we are in a real life mission, the first thing you actually want to do is to get the teapot to look, point roughly where the bad guys are. There are three ways of doing that in the Harrier. One, a map waypoint designation, two, snowplow, three, velocity vector slave. So first of all, let's look at the map. So on our left screen here, we're gonna get map up again. And we're gonna click, sorry, my eyes are too bad, I've gotta go and zoom in, uh, Des G. We've now designated from the map and we've designated on waypoint one, as you can see. What that's done is now slave the teapot to waypoint one. That's a good start. That's got the teapot pointing roughly in the right direction. Obviously, I happen to have a waypoint near the target. Well, let's undo that now. Remove that. The next way is going to be snowplow. We can see which mode the teapot is in on this line of text here. Currently, slave to velocity vector. Well, I want to change that to a snowplow mode. I'm gonna press nosal steering. It's now in snowplow. Out of interest, if I press it again, we're back to slave velocity vector. Note that in different conditions, there will be other options for what happens here when you press nose or steering. But for the time being, because we have no other designations, I can just cycle between these two. So, snowplow. That points the teapot at the bore site of the aircraft, the longitudinal axis of the aircraft, pointing forwards, obviously, until told otherwise. Well, I'm now gonna press my DDC slew keys and I can move it down. I'm in active pause here. There's no way I could do this without an active pause, so just bear that in mind. And what's happening is I'm moving, obviously, the teapot around. Every time I release the TDC slew keys, it creates a target point. And quickly look at the hub symbology. It's extremely simple. The, the octagon shows where the teapot is pointing in the hub, along with the dot. The diamond shows where our current T0 target designation is. So, I mean, remember, I'm working from snowplow mode here. I'm moving about, and you can see I'm moving the octagon about. Every time I stop moving, it recalculates T0 target, and we've also got the target there. 
that's the basic symbology for the teapot. We don't really need to know anything else. The third way of initial pointing is from velocity vector slave. So let's nozzle steering to cancel our current designation. And again, we're now in slave velocity vector, velocity vector slave, same thing. What that does is slave temporarily the teapot to this guy here, the velocity vector. That's representing where the aircraft is going. Now, what I would do, I'm going to unpause here and kind of multitask. I'm going to point my velocity vector at the target, and you can see it's following it. And I'm going to pause again there. And you can see at that point, I'm pointing roughly in the target area. Sorry, this is the target area, I should have explained. At that point, I'm going to press TDC down once to create T0 target. We've now got T0 target. You can see, sorry, we've got lots of things in the way. We've got the circle, which is the waypoint. We've got the octagon, which is the t bob position. We've got the diamond, which is the T0 target. We've got the velocity vector in the middle there. Once we've created that T0 target, we can use the TDC slew keys to move around. So that is a description of the three different ways we can give initial pointing with the Lightning G4 in the Harrier. Next, we're going to look at symbology. Starting here and going clockwise, we've got super wide field of view. Click that and you've literally got what it says, a super wide field of view. For some reason it always defaults to the flow when you do that, so you might want to put it back and it's modal so you can turn it off like that. Next, lots of text here. So, T-Pod, that's telling you you're in T-Pod HODAS mode and that this is soaring. 1688 is telling us our current laser designator PRF Co. The current point on our terrain that our T-Pod crosshair is pointing at is conveyed to us in lat long here as well as elevation in feet above sea level and MGRS coordinates here, grid coordinate. Next, MTC. We can't find out what that is. No one in the world seems to know what that is, so we're going to ignore that. This guy here obviously turns it back to standby and turns it back on. We're not going to press that. Next, slave. We've already talked about that. When the teapot is slave to another sensor, slave will be boxed here. Or we can force a slave by clicking that OSB here, and that will force a slave to the active sensor. PIP, not modeled. These guys here, uh, they take a little bit of understanding. Once you get a head round of them, it makes sense. The top line here is telling us what is currently soy. That's the best way of explaining that. Currently it's teapot or a teapot designation. Uh, it could be hard, it could be the DMT, it could be the map as we saw before. This second one here is best described as the following method of the teapot. So currently it is following the teapot designation. It could be following the velocity vector slave. It could be following the snowplow. So we currently saw it is T-Pod and we're following the T-Pod designation. For situation awareness, this guy here is our barometric altitude in feet above mean sea level. This guy here, no one in the world can seem to tell us what that is. So sorry, it may get populated at some point. At the moment, it doesn't seem to do anything. Next is a HUD repeater for our sun flight instruments for situation awareness. Horizon line right and left, velocity vector, watermark or ball sight or longitudinal axis, whatever you want to say it there. This here in text is our type of track, currently an area track. Moving on to the reticle, a crosshair here is obviously showing the point here that we are aiming at with our teapot. These four corners here show the maximum extents of the next further in field of view. So if I were to go into narrow field of view here and then back out, narrow field of view was there at the largest extent. This guy here is our reticle yardstick and probably the best way to show you what that is, is if I were to zoom in on something, there you go, that guy there. What it's telling you is that these particular parameters, that line there, as well as that line, that line and that line, are 28 meters so if I wanted to convey how long this hangar was to someone else I could measure it there and say that's 28 meters so the hangar is probably about 30 to 32 meters this guy here is our northing vector it's telling us the mag direction to magnetic north not from us but from the 
point on the terrain that the T-board is pointing to, which is there, obviously. So from there, north is kind of out in that direction. Again, for our situational awareness. Again, speaking of situational awareness, this guy here, which I missed, is our situational awareness cue. It shows where the teapot is pointing in terms of vector or angle in relation to our aeroplane. So if it's up ahead of us here, it's pointing forwards. There would be behind us. There would be left of us. There would be right of us. There would be directly underneath us. And you can interpolate anything in between. Next, that there is our true speed in knots. That there is the heading or maybe bearing in degrees magnetic from our aircraft to where our teapot is pointing or the point on the terrain that our teapot is pointing to and there is nautical miles the distance so what we could say is that the T0 that I'm designating automatically here at that point there is 347 degrees from us at 8.1 nautical miles this here is our current time UTC this here is our type of track, your area track, point track and moving target track and we'll go through those a little bit later. This here is INR track. Next is field of view, wide or narrow. Remember that there are HOTAS commands or sensor controls or sensor select switch commands that operate most of these operations. I'm going to skip over data and come back to it. CCD, do we want optical sensor or do we want infrared sensor basic zoom up to I've never gone in this far before but up to 16 zoom by the look of it it's a push and hold affair and finally data there are if we go into data lots of options spring up most of them have no interest or just don't work some are very interesting first of all we can reject the flight symbology or the HUD symbology uh, if we go to flirt we get some extra ones focus here I haven't figured out if this actually works or not, but you can at least press the buttons. Back to CCD. Here's the most important thing though. If we go to our ODU over on the left, we get three options. 2DY, D-Link and MTT. Non-functional. Non-functional. 2DY is functional. This is our uh, 2D yardstick. Really interesting. So click on there. What this is going to give us, if we turn it on, and we're going to turn it on there, ping is that. A 2D yardstick. Now, I would actually call that a 3D yardstick, but Rasband called it a 2D yardstick. Um, what we can say is that the radius of this circle from here, obviously, to the circle is 100 meters. Well, we can change that. We can type in, I don't know, 120 meters. Ping. Or maybe we can change the feet and go 250 feet. I can find it. Ping. There or we could increase and decrease in hundreds of feet. So what we're getting at there is that we've got a, what I would call a three-dimensional uh, circular yardstick as well as our crosshair element yardstick that we saw there. So that could be really useful. F for feet, M for meters. I'm gonna leave that on because it's quite cool. Otherwise, data has no real use. It does in the real aircraft, but you know, just a lot of that stuff simply isn't relevant to DCS, so it's been left out. That's it for now for Symbology. Next, we're going to move on to our fourth segment, which is Target Tracks. And that's going to be super simple. We're not going to look into weapons today. It's fully covered in the weapons tutorial. But we're going to show how we can get to the point at which we can deploy a weapon. So, tanks here. Let's go and zoom in. Everyone likes blowing tanks up. I'm going to zoom in and we're going to designate one of these tanks. Now, remember we've got automatic designation on. If you wanted to manually designate, it would be TDC down. We're currently by default in area track, which is tracking the point on the terrain that the teapot is pointing to. In that case, you know, that bottom point there of that tank's right track. At that point, as it is, that's everything we need now to go and drop our bomb. We would then select our CCRP Mark 82 or whatever, and we could go and employ that on that vehicle. Area track is used for static only. It could be a static vehicle, it could be a static building, static infrastructure. We would not use it on a moving target. Next, what if it's a moving target? Well, we've got two modes that we can use for moving targets, point track and moving target track. Now, in the real T-Pod, there is a difference between those two things. In DCS, because it's just not as complex as real life, they're the same. So you can either use point track or uh, moving target track 
it'll be the same thing. So let's go and pick the guy up. There he is. You could do this in Fleur, or you could do this in um, CCD. I'm going to hover over him. I'm going to get to point track. I'm going to move onto him, and that's got a point track. He may lose him behind the trees. That's just tough. There, I've got a point track. Again, at that point, that's everything we need. We can now select our weapon, use our HUD symbology, and go and bomb the target. Moving target track, exactly the same. Back to area track or static target. The INR track is a thing, but as far as we can see in DCS, as far as anyone tells us, it's not actually used for anything. So back to area track. That takes us on to the laser, which is going to be the last part. So if we're going to go drop our laser guided bombs via our Maverick E, we need a laser. So we need to unsafe the laser or arm it. Laser is now armed. L-tip, that is a laser ranger. It can be used for positioning J-downs, for instance, and I'm sure other things. It's a way of ranging a target to extremely high accuracy. Next, we want to choose which type of laser. A training designator, or training laser. A laser designator with the associated PRF code. A laser designator and an optical marker. An optical marker. I say optical, I, technically I think that's wrong. It's a, I think it's a laser marker, but it's, it's there for marking. Uh, for people with night vision goggles. Eyes, this is a uh, kind of uh, low intensity laser that means it won't blind friendly people's eyes if I accidentally hit them in the eyes. Probably not modelled in DCS. So we're just going to go back to uh, designating laser and all I've got to do to fire the laser is press fire. When I'm pressing fire the L flashes, there is a maximum range of 10 nautical miles slant range in real life, there is a burnout time if you fire, you know, an overheat time and it will turn itself off after a certain amount of time. We're still not sure if that's modelled in DTS, but just bear in mind, you may not be able to fire it forever. Turn the laser off. That's pretty much our summary. Uh, one thing I've just realised I missed, once you're in FLIR, you've got your polarity here, white hot or black hot polarity, just, you know, visual polarity, and you'll get your gain as well. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure we're, that's everything we need covered on our Lightning G4 teapot on the Harrier, April 2021. I hope that was useful and see you later.